Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and they will go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And I have came that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand is not the sh shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man that runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for a sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and my sheep knows me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for, for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not in the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and they shall be one flock, one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it up for me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that we can come together this morning just to praise you, just to worship you. Father God, may you bless every single person that's in this place today. May we fix our eyes on Jesus and Jesus alone. May your Holy Spirit rush over this place this morning, Lord. May we just come to this place and just lay everything down. May chains be broken. Father God, may we come as broken vessels and you be the potter and build us back up again. Father God, we love you and we give you all the praise and all the glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all of us say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said Some of y'all may have seen him or known him around the community. Um, there's something that uh, he has. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to uh, look at it. If you haven't seen one before, there we go. If you haven't seen one before, it's called a shofar. Um, and what it is, it's actually an instrument that they also, they used a lot in Israel. And they still use it to this day. Um, one of the things that they do, and some people don't know this, but sometimes when they go into wars and stuff like that, in the Old Testament, even to this day, from my understanding, they blow a shofar. And what a shofar is, is basically an instrument that God instituted in the Old Testament as an indication or a declaration of war that we're taking this land. And, um, of course, there's a whole lot more significance to that. We're not going to go into all that, because that's a whole new teaching in itself. But Robert is going to blow that this morning before we go into worship as a declaration that we're saying we're putting our stamp right here. And we are taking our land, we're taking our city, we're taking the neighbors that are around us, and we're putting a footprint right here. Amen. And, um, and as he blows that, I just encourage you to enter into worship. Um, if you know anything about a lot of your Jewish worship, and no, we're not Jewish, we're not, we're, we're not going to try to be Jewish either. Um, and, but what, if you know anything about Jewish worship, a lot of times in your Jewish worship, before they'll start worship, they'll blow a shofar. And it's, it's a battle cry. And um, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set the mic down, he'll blow the shofar, we're going to go into, into our uh, worship this morning, and then we're going to go on from service from there, amen.
and I, I want to make, I want to, I want to say this as well. Is anytime you're in worship here, if you feel like you need to sit down, or if you feel like you need to go and go to the bathroom or whatever, um, please do so. Don't feel like you have to do like everybody else is doing. We're not here to follow a crowd. We're here to worship the Lord. Amen. And however that is. But there's one thing about church that a lot of uh, we've gotten wrong. One of the things in the book of Hebrews, and like I've said, evangelists and pastors have preached this and said this for many years. And it comes out of the book of Hebrews. It says, forsake not the assembling together of yourselves. Now, us pastors love that because we love attendance. <laughs> I'll just be honest. But there's one crucial piece to that passage that we miss. And this is where we fail in practicing church. He said practice church is practice church. Because until you can walk into your identity, you have to practice what you're called to be. You understand what I'm saying? We're called to be the church. This isn't the church. The music isn't the church. We are the church. The people are the church. And there's one piece of, of Hebrews that talks about this, and, and this is something that we're going to incorporate and begin to practice. And I want to kind of stretch you out of your comfort zone a little bit this morning. And if for, for anybody that's even been in some charismatic Pentecostal circles, this may even stretch them out of their comfort zones a little bit. But I think you're going to enjoy what, what I want to do. As Hebrews says that to forsake not the selling together of yourselves. Yes, that's true. But there's a purpose for that. And the purpose for that in Hebrews, it says this, so that you can encourage one another, even as the days are approaching. If you come to church and you're not encouraged, and sometimes encouraged means a good kick in the... That's not what I'm encouraging you to do this morning. <laughs> but what I, want, what I want you to do is I don't want you to take, or just to take just a few minutes, like literally a few minutes, like a minute and a half, two minutes, really short time. And what I want you to do is I want you to pray for the people that are on each side of you. And then as you pray for them, I believe the Holy Spirit is going to give you one word. Just one word. Not a phrase, not a sermon, nothing like that. Just one word. Just one word. And that word is going to be an encouraging word for the person you just prayed for. It could be as simple as, man, you look nice today. It could be as simple as, man, you did an awesome job on that test. It could be, I'm just glad to see you. It's been a while since I've seen you. I believe that as you pray for that person on the right or the left, like I said, it's, it stretches some of you out because some of you is like, oh my goodness, that just prayer, pray for somebody just like freaks me out. That's okay. That's okay. Because I want to encourage you on this. There is no beautiful prayer. There is no right prayer. But there is a wrong prayer. The prayer that's not prayed. And so I just want to encourage you to do that. We're going to just shoot plays real softly. And I'll pray, I'll pray up here just kind of generally. And like I said, literally the people that are to your right and you're to your left. And so that should help you a little bit in your comfort zone in the sense that it's probably either your kids or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or maybe your husband or wife or maybe a good friend. So that puts you in your comfort zone a little bit. So that helps so. But we're gonna we're gonna pray. And I just want to encourage you to, like I said, and and, and, and yeah. Father, I thank you this morning because, Lord, your word teaches us to forsake not the assembly together of ourselves. And Father, we are so good at that, and we practice that so often. But, Father, there's one important piece of that passage that we so often forget. And, Lord, it's, it's, it's the fact that we need to encourage one another. And, Father, your word tells us to do this even more as we see the days approaching. Father, some of us this morning have come in here, and Lord, we've had a great holiday season, but Lord, some of us have had a hard holiday season. Some of us have walked through some stuff. And Lord, I know that this morning, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, as we pray for the person on our left, and as we pray for the person on our right, 
Father, that right now that you're speaking to our hearts, there's something that we can say to them that would lift them up, that would encourage them. Father, we come in today to bless you. We come in today to honor you, but we also come today to receive from you. And Father, your word teaches us that you use our brothers and sisters in all kinds of gifts. And you do that for the purpose of encouraging us to building us up and equipping us so that we can be the children you've called us to be. And so, Father, we just pray right now for each person, Lord, that is standing beside us, in front of us, behind us. And Lord, I'm believing that right now you're dropping a word, maybe a phrase, into our hearts that we can go and we can encourage that person with. Father, I thank you because I know right now you're faithful. Because you're always faithful. And yes, you are encouraging. I'm going to give you all the glory for it. Now, I want you to, I want, I want, I want you to do something. I want, you to do, I want you to look at the person to the right and to the left. And I know this might be kind of hard if you're turned right or to your back. But, but I want you to turn to the person. And I want you to give that encouraging word to them. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, whatever you felt like the Holy Spirit may have laid upon your heart, go, go ahead and just and give that word to them. Some of y'all are like, what? Give that, give that word to them. You might say, it sounds so stupid. And I'll tell you what, I guarantee you this. That word can really break, make or break somebody's day, amen? Praise God. Praise God. All right, well, you can, be, you can be seated this morning. Now, let me ask you this question. How many received a word from somebody? You kind of needed to hear that this morning. Anybody? Yes. All right, yes. So, see, there's, there's some people that they need to hear that. Now, how many is too shy to raise their hand at the minute that they need that? Still no one. Still no one. Still no one. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> God, God is so good. Amen. We're gonna we're gonna do something this morning. We're gonna we're gonna take communion together this morning, and, and uh, uh, we're gonna do this the first Sunday of every month. We're gonna take communion together, and, and uh, we're gonna do that this morning. We're gonna start off with our our, our service, the birthing of everything, taking communion together, breaking bread together, and um, and that's important. It's so important that we do that. So I just want to I want to encourage you as we do this. Um, we're we're going to be doing this differently all the time. So there's not going to be a routine of how we do it. There's going to be different ways of doing it. One of the things that I'm looking forward to is that there's some of us that are leaders of our homes and we don't even know how to give communion to our children. We're going to learn how to do that. Because as a spiritual leader of your home, you need to know how to do that. And you might say, well, man, I thought only a pastor or a deacon or an elder or a church leader could give communion. There is absolutely nothing in the scripture that says that. Nothing. So that means that we all, why is that? Because God calls us priests of the Most High. You're a priest of the Most High as a child of God. That means God's given you that authority to do that. And so we're not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that this morning, obviously. Um, because we're gonna I'm gonna be teaching that as time goes on because I think it's important as families that we be able to do that because we need to pray together, amen. And and to encourage each other and know that, you know, if it's a snowy day or a bad day or whatever, and we're not able to make it to church, we can still at home break out the juice and break out a piece of bread and sit and pray and have communion with our kids. Isn't that beautiful? Um, this is a beautiful thing. So um, what we're going to do is, is I'm going to have everybody come up. And we're going to gather around the altar area here. And um, our communion is, is a little bit different. We, make it, we made it easy this time because it's our first one. Um, I do have communion trays. We just don't have communion stuff, you know, put in it yet. Eventually we will. Um, we're going to have to be doing it a loaf of bread sometimes, juice sometimes, sometimes these things. It's not ever going to be the same. It's going to be different. Um, but it's like communion because when you're saying, why are you doing it so different? I'm doing it so different because everybody likes different things. Amen? We don't all like the same thing. Come on, get real. So what does that mean? We're going to need to do all kinds of different things to enjoy one another. 
And so uh, if we could have everybody come up, we're going to come up and then we're going to pass these out. Uh, Skip, can I have you and John uh, pass these out there? Make sure everybody gets done.
Praise God. Praise the Lord, amen. amen. God is so awesome. I got chili on the brain. You might have one up to the keys and join us with the chili afterwards. They got all that chili. Up there. If we did not bring chili, don't feel like you can't go. Please don't feel like you can't go. That's our sister church and great people. Um, they have helped us out so much. Um, just different things. We've got microphones and chairs and and uh, let me put it this way. It's been a long time since I've seen a church, a sponsor of a church, actually sponsor the launch or the birth of the church, the way it's supposed to be done. And I just wanted to really thank uh, the Keys and, and Richard and, and all of them um, that is up there uh, for what the, they're, they're believing in us. Amen? And, um, and, and so it, it's really nice. And uh, I want to also encourage you at the same time when you are giving just to make sure that you're making any checks that you make out, that you make it out to the keys with the, within the memo of the church plan. The only reason why that is is as of right now, legally, okay, we don't have our 501c3 yet because we're going through our sponsoring church. Here within, the, hopefully within the next month or two, we will have our legal status. Uh, until then, though, we want to stay legal. Amen. But at the same time, we want to build our funds because we also know that as we march forward and as we grow and as we do things for the Lord, we're going to need eventually more space, maybe a place with parking. I mean, who knows? New building, who knows? And um, and so uh, and, and so, I just wanted to also encourage you in that. And also, I just want to uh, just to remind everybody, today's not our launch day. Look at all the people that are here this morning. This is our first service, our birthing service. This is not our launch service. And, and, oh yeah, let me, yeah, I'll probably should explain that. Because <laughs> some people's like, what? What a birthing service is, and I'll kind of give you an idea. Birthing service, where, where we're at right here this morning, typically when you're birthing a church, we would be in someone's living room or we would be in the garage. Me. Super blessed. Yeah. Um, we would have zilch nothing. Nowhere to meet. We would not have a chair to sit on and maybe a dollar in the office. That is your typical birthing service. That is typically how churches are birthed. But when you look around this morning, does it look like we're typical? No. I don't think we're typical no. at all. There ain't nothing typical about us this morning. We are blessed. Yes, oh, we yeah. are blessed. Amen. We are blessed. <laughs> and, um, and so you're thinking, well, what is the difference between a birthing and a launching? A birthing today is our first time together. And so what we do now is over the next four months till Easter Sunday, is we dream the dreams of God, ask a lot of questions, get a lot of things started, try out a bunch of stuff, and see what God wants us to do. And perfect that so that on Easter Sunday when we launch and we say, hey, we're legal, we are formally the church, the church of the gate, and we are out there, and not just not just putting stuff on Facebook, not just putting stuff on social media and stuff, but actually out there, out there, we can say, hey, this is who we are. This is how we identify. This is what we're doing, and we've got it in that. You say, well, what's my part in that? Hey, what we need? We need smiling faces. You know, I met with the leadership leadership team, and, and, and one of the things that we've talked about over and over again is we don't want greeters. Every one of us is a greeter. Every one of us. Now, does that, now does that mean we don't have somebody standing at a table that can give information out? Of some, yes, we're going to have people that we're going to need that can stand at a, at a table and give information out of, as people come and seek for information. But we are all greeters. We are all huggers. We are all handshakers. We are all, yeah, we are all huggers, even though I don't like to hug a whole lot. We are all huggers. Some of y'all would have never known that because I hug you all the time. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, um, we are all that. That's us. We are all that. And so we're not going to have greeters. We're not going to have a science of greeters because we are all greeters. We all greet one another. And we all say we are having a friendly smile. <laughs> 
And so the birthing, the birthing is, is this is our first time together. Like I said, a lot of time, most of the time, almost every time, the birthing is always in someone's living room, in a garage, maybe in a coffee shop. Nor normally there may be like two or three people um, that are present um, and, and this sort of thing. And so we are really, really, really blessed to be birthing right here. Because what that means is that all we can do over the next four months is grow and dream. Amen. And you all have plenty of people that you can call and get them here. <laughs> Amen. And we want to be hitting the streets. We're going to be knocking on doors. we got all kinds of great things that are going on. And um, we're going to be very unique um, in, in the sense of being missional. Um, we're going to be a very missional, missional community of believers. I don't, I, I, I don't even like the word church very much. And the reason why I don't like it is because of the negative connotation that religious organizations have made it. And it's not very biblical sometimes because we end up in these corners of pockets or thought. And it's like, you're not even reaching the lost. You're not even reaching the broken. How can you even call yourself a church? And, and we're not going to be that way. We don't want to be that way. Amen. We're about reaching the lost and going out and, and seeing lives change for God. And, and, that's, and that's what it's all about. Amen. And so, um, but that's birthing. And so, over the next four months, you're going to be contacted. You're going to be asked if you want to do things. If you want something that's on your heart. And I want to say, I want to say this to the young people that are in here. I'm glad to see all the young people. Yeah. And uh, 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 I see everybody else too. Don't think I would like you. <laughs> That's just, I love young people. Um, and, uh, but I want to say this to the young people. This is your house too. I want to hear your dreams. We want to hear your dreams. We want to hear your heart for the city. We want to hear your heart for the community and the streets. You have an idea. We want to hear it because we may want to end up doing it. You're saying, well, 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 nobody wants to do that. You're all too old. <laughs> Don't ever say that to us. <laughs> we can do more than you think that we you can know, do. You know. We just need fresh ideas. That's all. That's all. And so I just want to encourage you. Um, you know, some of y'all, um, we have a drum set um, with these symbols. And they're, I think, like $280, I think, for the three set of symbols. Uh, Lanham said they'll tune them for us for 10 bucks. Um, so we get some cymbals and stuff, we'll have a drum set, so we'll get a band going. You play guitar, you know someone plays guitar, or just that. You know, and I want to encourage you on this too, is that we, we, we have this religious idea sometimes, that you have to be saved to play an instrument or to serve the church. There's no word that says that. Now, you have to be saved to be a leadership, yes. you got to love the God and serve God. But if you got somebody that you know that, that maybe they're not saved, but they play an instrument, and maybe this maybe it's a way of pulling them into church, we can use some guitar players. Um, and would love to uh, get some guitar players in here and, and to get a get a, a full worship band going. Wouldn't that be beautiful? Amen. To have all kinds of different instruments and, and different things in a worship band. Um, um, Tracy, uh, you know, I encourage you if you can sing, Tracy, you know, get with Tracy. Um, let me know who the person is. I'll get the names and everything to Tracy and she can get in contact with them and meet with them. I know, uh, I'm going to put Lillian on the spot. I know Lillian sings. Um, <laughs> look at her now, poor baby. Um, so I don't you know if you sing. I don't care what age you are. I don't care what you look like. It's probably better than me. But anyway, um, <laughs> I don't care what you look like. If you got a talent you want to be used, just let us know. Okay? We, we want to use you. We need you. And uh, we want you to be part of it. Well, I'm going to go in this morning to the message out of Zechariah chapter 9, starting at verse 11. And um, this is, is a powerful passage. And I actually got this passage about two weeks ago. Or actually a week ago, I'm sorry. Um, and everybody has been not bugging me, but asking me, what are you going to preach on the first message that you meet with everybody? What are you, what are you going to preach on? Are you going to preach on the gate? 
That was the first question. Hey, y'all, I bet you're going to go to John 10, 10. Huh? I bet you're going to go to the book of Acts. Huh? I'm going to Zechariah chapter 9. <laughs> and uh, you're not going to find the word gate in here anywhere. Um, <laughs> but what you're going to find is something very beautiful. And I believe it's a good foundational piece for today. Um, and what I want to talk about today is, is because of the blood. You know, we could, it, we could think of a lot of different things as to why we are here today. But the bottom line, the reason why we are here is because of the blood. Bottom line. Brent, I mean, the way your life has changed, man. I mean, because of the blood. You know, I, that was beautiful. If y'all aren't friends with him on Facebook, get friends with him on Facebook. He's got a powerful testimony yes. that went on Facebook the other night. Because of the blood, bro. Yes. And, um, and do you care? Do, I, do you care if I share this real quick about your 23 years? Today, today, as we are birthing here, Church of the Gate, today marks 23 years. Is that right? That, am I saying that right? Or am I completely messing that up? 23 years of what? 23 years ago began my downward spiral into addiction. Uh, four years ago I went to prison. I got out two years ago. Uh, it, it wasn't until I was in prison that I actually took a look at myself and who I could come. And through through endless time of, of looking at myself, I realized that what that was the best was for me. Amen. And so you've been clean and sober now for what? Two years? Two years in prison and two years out. Two years in prison and two years out. Amen. <laughs> Four years clean and sober. Woo. Praise Amen. the Lord. Yeah, it's Amen. emotional. I know. I, yeah. I know. And, and mom there, I know you're proud of him. <laughs> I know without that, you're proud of him. And, and so, you know, God God does amazing things, amen. But it's because of the blood. The blood. Yeah. 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 You know, no other reason. It's the blood. And and so, you know, and that's, that's the beautiful thing about it. Uh, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 11, um, starts off and it says, As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you. And that's the way it starts off. And Father, I thank you this morning as we go into your word. Lord, I ask that you would just move in power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray this morning, God, that our hearts not just be open, but our hearts receive. Father, I pray, Lord, as we go into your word, that you would show us our identity. That you would show us just how special we really are in your sight. That you would show us, Lord, who we are. Not because we're perfect, not because of anything we've done, but because of the blood covenant you've made with us. Father, as we go into this passage, I just ask that you would just move, encourage us, strengthen us, love us in ways that we've never experienced before. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to do something a little unique. Um, I'm, I'm going to kind of engage you a little bit, if that's okay this morning. Um, and what I want you to do is I want you to close your eyes and promise me not to fall asleep. <laughs> Some of you are like, oh, I'm not a morning person. I'm not either. I hate mornings. You and my son can sleep till noon um, and be up till 4 in the morning. That's probably why you sleep <laughs> time. Um, <laughs> Dan is like, no, no, no. <laughs> but I want, to, I want to do something real quick. I want you to close your eyes a second. And I'm going to give you a story. And as I give you this story, I want you to envision yourself as being here at this place. It's about 11 o'clock at night. The evening is, is getting dark, 11 o'clock at night. And it becomes so dark that you can't even see your hand in front of you. And the heavy darkness is so heavy. The darkness is just so pitch black dark. And it begins to paralyze you. Almost like it's so dark, it's almost like a sense of hopelessness. Because it's just so dark, you can't see anything. Then you see this sparkling light just come out of the middle of nowhere. 
And the sparkling light is similar to like a sparkler, like flying through the sky. And as it's flying through the sky, it leaves this trail of white smoke behind it. The light sparkles with various colors like a sparkler does. You see blue colors, you see red colors, you see yellow colors, you see green colors. You see all kinds of just different colors. But somehow, this light provides a sense of safety. You don't quite understand it, but when you see this sparkling light, it kind of provides this sense of safety from the darkness. And you immediately begin to just be drawn to it. You can't understand it, but you just begin to be drawn to it. All of a sudden, the sparkling light pierces the darkness. And when it pierces the darkness, it leaves behind a sense of sight and hope. As the sparkling light squares off the area, roughly about one or two miles, all of a sudden, the air thickens with this white smoke and covers everything like some type of comfortable, warm blanket. Although beautiful, the heat from the center of the light permeates the surroundings and immediately you know not to touch it. Then suddenly, you find yourself standing on the edge of a sidewalk. And you're watching people congregate in the streets. Huge smiles display upon every face. Some are even joyfully dancing in the street. The white smoke thickens and covers the area like a blanket. Yet, you can see through the white smoke, and it lights up the entire area. As people enter the streets, the darkness disappears as though it was pierced with the light like a well-sharpened sword, and then scatters as though being chased away. Then you hear these words. My child, I'm sending you into a ripened harvest. Many have given up. And even naysayers have declared a negative confession among these people. But I say I have been preparing the ground. The seed has been planted, and it is harvest time. I say go and reap what you have not sown, and reap what you have not planted. For I am going to cause it to grow and to bloom. Then you are taken to Zechariah 9.16, and you begin to read these words. And the Lord their God will save them in that day as the flock of his people. For they are as the stones of a crown, sparkling in the land. Now open your eyes. What did you sense? Did you sense the excitement? Yeah. Did you sense the hope? You know, it's dark, it's piercing, it's paralyzing outside. And all of a sudden, the sparkling, the beauty of the light, the beauty of the sparkles, the beauty of what is going on, this smoke that's covering that area. I experienced that same emotion about a week ago. I come down here, and there's about a mile, two mile block area that I just I go down Alabama, I go down 59, come up, and go back down King Hill. And I just kind of drive around, and I pray over the entire area. And as I was praying one night, I was actually heading back up Alabama. And as I'm heading back up um, Alabama, and this is the day after Christmas, if you're kind of wondering, the day after Christmas, and as I was driving up the streets, I began to have this vision. And this is exactly what I saw and exactly what I felt and what I heard. See, when you, when you look at scripture and say, well, how in the world is that biblical? First of all, we know why it has to do with purity and the Holy Spirit. Smoke oftentimes has to do with the glory of God. We know light is what? Jesus Christ. We know that not only God, but God's light is splendorous with all kinds of glorious colors. What is the hope? The hope is the gospel message going throughout the land. You're saying, well, how can you say the harvest is plentiful? Because when you go into the gospels, Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, the labors are few. But he takes it a step further and he says, the harvest is ripe. Yep. We don't wait on the harvest. We go out to the harvest and bring them in. I don't know a former one that sits in his house waiting for the corn just to come on off the stock, grab into the truck and drive itself down to be found. Unloaded. No, what's the farmer do? The farmer goes out and gets that corn off that stock, whether it's pick the corn off, use a machine, whatever, whatever the farmer does. I'm not much of the farming with the corn, so I'm not a whole lot. But whatever the farmer does with that, the farmer has to leave his house. 
He's got to get out in the streets. He's got to get out among the people. That's the only way the harvest comes in. That's the only way you see the harvest happen. And so Jesus was telling people, he's like, the laborers are few. What's he saying? Not many will go out in the streets. Not many will go out into the highways and byways. But those that do will find a right harvest. Those that do will find people that are hungry. Those that do will find people that are looking for hope. And the beautiful thing this morning is that every single one of you have hope to give somebody else. Who are you giving hope to right now? Who in your life are you giving hope to? Who in your life are you, and I challenge, I challenge, I challenge leaders this all the time. Who are you mentoring? Who are you trying to bring under your wing? I'm, I'm not saying you've won them to the Lord yet. If you haven't won them to the Lord yet, that's okay. But what path are you doing to encourage them to lead them to that path where they can one day decide to love Jesus? It's a good question. Who is it in your life that you're doing that with? And so Zachariah here, I'm led to Zachariah, and I read these words, and I'm like, oh my goodness, wow. Wow, Lord, what a powerful, powerful passage. And so we're going to look at 9, 11 through 17 this morning and, 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 and talk about this because it is absolutely beautiful what God is telling the church here. And it's just absolutely beautiful. So if you look at Zechariah 9, 11 through 17, there's, there's actually 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I got five points this morning. I'm going to leave you here a long time. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> But I've got five points this morning that are actually taken out of these verses right out of Zechariah that are absolutely beautiful. And the thing is, is that when we look at these verses of Scripture, these, these verses of Scripture are after the prophecy that God gives about Jesus Christ coming as a child. We all know we celebrated Christmas, right? And celebrated as a child, as his birthday. Well, this is after the fact. This is after that prophecy. This is for the here and now, and which is beautiful. Because we know that the prophecy of Jesus' birth had happened, but there was also prophecies in Scripture that talk about the here and now as the church. Who we are to be, what we are to be doing, right? And so we're going to look at that real quick. And so verse 11, it says this, I have set your prisoners free from the waterless pits. Now you're going to notice as we go through these verses of Scripture, there ain't nothing you can do for this. You just have to receive it. And if you're like me, receiving anything is hard. Why? Because we have to swallow our pride. Ain't that right, Skip? Yeah. <laughs> we have to swallow our pride. Because receiving is hard because sometimes when we have to receive, we feel less than. Well, and the reality is, is that when we receive, it's because I'm blessed then. Did you hear what I'm saying? I receive because I'm blessed then. Not that I'm blessed then, but because I'm blessed then. I'm blessed then. Why? Because I'm a child of God. That's why I receive. But also we know that it's more blessed to give, right? <laughs> that's why receiving is harder sometimes. But notice what verse 11 says. It says, I have set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. What, what, is, what is he saying here? What is, you know, as we're thinking about being, a, you know, we're coming together as a community of believers. We're coming together as a community of, of people that are serving and loving the Lord and, and wanting to reach our community and, and, and doing all these things. And we're, we're becoming a, a powerful move of the Holy Spirit as we're becoming kingdom empowered as we're outwardly focused. What, what is the Word of God telling us here? It's telling us that Jesus sets people. It tells us that people that have dealt with addictions, people that have dealt with abuse, people that have dealt with sickness and all kinds of other things that have gone on in their life, that God has come to set us free. Now, I don't know about you, but I love freedom. I love freedom so much that it is extremely hard when someone begins to boss me around and tell me what to do. I get edgy. And some of y'all understand that, kids? I get you. <laughs> I get you. And, and so, you know, I understand that. 
But freedom also comes responsibility. But he frees the captive. He sets us free. Matter of fact, you go into all of the Gospels, and one of the, one of the things that you find over and over with Jesus, what does he do? He sets people free over and over and over again. Verse 12, listen to this. This is beautiful. Verse 12 says, Return to the stronghold, O prisoners, who have the hope. This very day I am declaring that I will restore double to you. <laughs> Don't that sound beautiful? Double to me? What? Yeah. Wow. How many wants double? I want double. You're saying, oh, you're talking about prosperity. I am not. I didn't say anything about money. Although, you know, it's a little no. But <laughs> I didn't say nothing about money. But listen to what it says. Restore double to you. Double the favor. Double the blessing. Double, 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 double. Double digits. It doesn't say you have to go out broke. It doesn't say you have to go out broken. It doesn't have to say you have to go out busted. It says you can go out blessed. Yeah. And Amen. double. Yeah. And double. Does that mean you're going to drive a, a limo? Or you're going to have a mansion and all that stuff? No, 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 no. That's not what it means. It means that you're going to be blessed of the Father. You're going to have peace. You're going to have joy. You're going to have encouragement. You're going to have comfort. You're going to have when you go through a struggle. You're going to know you're going to yeah. live. That's what you're going to have. That's the blessed life. That's the blessing. That's the favor. And who wants double of that? I know I do. Who yes. wants double that when I go in and I have a relationship that I need to mend, and all of a sudden because I step out of faith, because I know that I was done wrong, but I'm still going to forgive anyway, and I step out of faith and say, God, I'm going to do what your word says. And because I'm restoring this faith, of restoring this relationship, all of a sudden I gain double, and someone I didn't even try to restore comes to my door to restore. Double. You see what I'm saying? That's a blessed life. So what is what does the word tell us? It tells us that he restores a sense of safety, he restores a sense of hope, and he gives us a double portion. If you don't get to earn it, you have to receive it. Wow. Why? Because of a blood covenant. That we read in verse 11. Verse 13. For I will bend Judah as my bow. I will fill the bow with Ephraim. And I will stir up your sons of Zion against your sons of Greece. And I will make you like a warrior's sword. What is he saying in verse 13? He's saying, I've called you to be a warrior. I've not called you to hide out. I've not called you to sit back. I've not called you to be weak. I've not called you to be anybody but a warrior that is willing to go to the forefront and say, I've got this. I've got this. And I've got this because he's got this. And because he's got this, I've got this. And there's some areas of our life, when you think about it, they are such a mess, and we have cowered back instead of moved forward because we've allowed it to overwhelm us. And realize, instead of realizing that we can be the one to overwhelm the trouble instead of letting the trouble overwhelm us. And for some of us, that's part. I know. I get it. I've been there. I've done it. I know. But here's the encouraging part is you can still do it because it's not you. Is God in you that does it? That's the beautiful thing about it. He produces warriors. You're a warrior this morning. A warrior. You're a champion. And it's kind of like a rocky, right? <laughs> I love rocky babies. But you're a champion. You're a warrior. Don't feel like you have to take a back seat. When I went, when I, when I used to go to Fort Leavenworth, I would tell, I would start a summer cover on every single time like this. And I would tell the guys in there, I would tell them, I was like, you know, guys, I appreciate what you've done for our country. I appreciate what the sacrifices you've made. I appreciate the fact that you can stare down the barrel of a gun, that you can hold a hand grenade, you can drive a tank, drive an airplane, you can do all these wonderful things in protecting our country. I thank you that you can do those things. And for many of you, you think that makes you a man, but I want you to know that because you're sitting where you're at right now, you're a coward. And you would think, some of them were, you know, yeah, they keep them. Yeah, real quick. 
And you'd think that I'd be afraid to stir up trouble like that. But you know, those men thought, thank me every time I would start off like that. And the reason why is because I would tell them that you're a coward. Because you're strong at being a man out here. But when it comes to the inner issues, you run. You hide. Instead of dealing with what's going on inside. Twilight Paris used to sing a song a long time ago. And it talks about a warrior as a child. Some of you all may have heard that song. Beautiful song. And when, when in her song, what she talks about is the fact that every single one of us is a warrior inside. But sometimes that warrior inside reverts back to that being a child. We may look strong on the outside. We may look like we like he man on the outside or she woman or whatever on the outside. Like we're taking the, you know, I'm going to kind of do the superhero thing, you know, Superman or Batman girl or whatever, you know, on the outside. But it's I'm just a child. You know, I was encouraging the kids last night over here when we praying. And I told them, I said, you know, I said, kids, I said, you all don't need faith like us adults. We need faith like you. We need faith like you. Because we do. There's something about when we get older, we get a tend to sometimes get a little um, not edgy, also time we get cranky, but but we get kind of just jag, jag, jagged, I guess, or jaded is the word I'm looking for. And because we get a little jaded, it's hard for us to really have the faith that we used to have. To really believe the, the dreams that God has for us are still real now. And to dream the way God wanted us to dream. And I want to encourage you this morning, if you are that adult this morning, who has kind of shrunk back into that child, and saying, man, I don't feel like that warrior anymore. I want to encourage you with this. You are a warrior. You are a warrior. And the victory is yours. Go take it. Go take it. Verse 14 and 15. It says, Then the Lord will appear over them, and His arrow will go forth like lightning. And the Lord God will blow the trumpet. And it's kind of interesting. He didn't have no idea I was preaching on this. Blow the trumpet, and will march in the storm winds of the south. The Lord of hosts will defend them, and they will devour and trample on the slain stone. Who would you like to trample on some things in your life? Anybody got some debt you like to trample on? And they will drink and be boisterous as with wine. Notice it didn't say they were drunk with wine. It says as though they were. And they will be filled with a sacrifice, sacrificial basin, drenched with the corners of the altar. What in the heck is he talking about here? Well, there's, there's three things right here that is real important. First of all, he defends you. Those areas and those times of your life that you feel like the whole entire world against you, he defends you. He defends you. He is your defense. Who needs a good lawyer when Mr. Jesus is the Lord? Yeah. King Jesus can be my lawyer any day that King Jesus was the Lord. He defends you. But here's the thing that I like, and I can go on preaching on this for years, and I can't even, I don't know how to intellectually, I don't know how to emotionally, spiritually, I don't know how to connect this to you in a way that I'm really sense it in my spirit. But there's one thing that God does for each one of us this morning that we have got to understand. He champions you. He champions you. What does that mean? What does that what do you mean he champions you? He believes you and believes in you so much that he believes in you more than you believe in yourself. <laughs> He believes in you so much that He celebrates you, that He honors you, that He honors you to the point that the Bible even tells us that He's faithful even when you're not faithful. Because He honors us. He champions you. He fights for you. He defends you. He's in your corner. Isn't that beautiful? He's the friend that sits closer to the brother. I don't know. You know, and I have sat and I've wrestled with this and wrestled with this. God, how do I even 
really portray or even really get across that word champion in the depths of the way I feel in my spirit. Because sometimes in our life, we get into areas we are so broken, we hurt so bad, and we feel like nobody's champion for us. And we need to realize that it's even in those times, and most likely, and for sure, and for certain, in those times, that God champions us the most. We may not feel it, but faith is not about feeling. It's not about seeing. It's about knowing. Knowing the God changes. But He also anoints you. What, how, where did you get the word anoint out of this? You look at that very last part of that. It says drenched like the corners of the altar. What's the altar represent? It represents the anointing. So He defends you. So He, he frees the captives. But when He frees you, He restores you to a safe place, brings hope in your life. He blesses you with a dull portion. He causes you to be a warrior. Not timid and fall behind. But when you are a warrior, he goes and he defends you and he champions you and he anoints you so that you can do the work that he's called you to do. Verse 16 and 17, and we're going to end it on this. And the Lord their God will save them in that day as the flock of his people. For they are as the stones of the crown, sparkling in his land. Hmm. And what Commonness and beauty will be theirs. Grain will make the young men flourish and the new wine the virgins. What in the world is he talking about here? There are some powerful words in this passage that are in these verses right here that ends all of this up, tallies all of this up. When you look at verse 16, there's some there's four words I, I want to kind of highlight. The words save, stone, crown, and sparkle. Now notice the word sparkle that is in, or sparkling that is in this. What is interesting about this verse of scripture is that we just experienced a few minutes ago when I had you close your eyes. I hope many of you were able to creatively experience that. The sparkling of that sparkle going and piercing the darkness. And we're going to talk about that right here just for a second. But what do these words mean? What are they significant? Well, you know, honestly, when I look at the word save in Scripture, a lot of times I go to that word save, and the first thing that I think of is salvation, right? But in this passage, that's not what it's saying. That's not what it's meaning at all. What, this, what it means in this passage is that when He saves or He saves you, what He's saying here is the Lord will position you. He's not just bringing you salvation. He's not just bringing you double portion. He's not just bringing you hope. He's not just calling you a warrior, defending you, and championing you, and anointing you. But he's bringing you into a position. And what is this position that he's bringing you into? He's creating. He's creating. Okay. He's, or I'm sorry. He's liberating us to a victorious position of freedom. In other words, the Lord tramples upon your doubts, your troubles, the evil. The, the garbage that goes on around you, he tramples upon that and brings you into a position of victory. So when, so when we are serving the Lord, now notice, none of this stuff do we earn. None of this stuff do we work for. None of this stuff do, do we say enough prayers for. This is stuff we receive from God because we are his child. You are not defeated this morning. Anxiety is not your monster. You are the monster to anxiety. Depression is not your monster. You're the monster to depression. Addiction is not your monster. You're the monster to addiction. Failed relationships is not your monster. You are the monster to failed relationship. Why? Because when that stuff shows up, you show up as a child and you stand in a position of victory. Not because you've done anything, but because you are a child of the king. And you know who you are. And so when he saves you, that word save means he's positioning you in that place of liberation. How many wants to be there? Amen. Oh, yes. So the word stone, this, this, the second word stone, 
what in the world does the word stone mean? This is why I love going back and doing word study. Doing word study. The word stone actually indicates an equipping. So he positions you, and then he comes along and he equips you. See, many of us have been in, in positions or understandings of who we are in Christ, but we've never been equipped. And because we've never been equipped, we've never watched out to do anything for you. That's about to change. Amen. That is about to change. Amen. Because we are all called and we are all equipped. Yes, because he positions us into a place of victory. Why? Because he equips us. How does he does? How does he do this? Well, this word "stone" gives us the idea of a, a, a creator being upon his potter's wheel and designing something. So, what God has done is He has put you on the potter's wheel, and as He's put you on the potter's wheel, He begins to design you. Now, here's the beauty of this: in the Hebrew, it's not just design you, okay, in the sense of all oh, He's created you. You know, one of the worst things you could ever say to me, because I'll look at you and say, you need to go read the Bible. I don't know who you are in God. It's when someone comes up to me and says, that's just the way I was, and that's just the way I am, because God created me this way. God don't create mess. Amen. You do. Put blame on God and clean it up. Ouch. Anyway. <laughs> But he's creating you. And how is he creating you? In the Hebrews, he's talking about he's creating you into a royal standard. A royal standard. But there's something else that he's saying here when he's creating you. He's looking and he's creating you and designing you. And he's saying, you're precious. You're precious. You're beautiful. You're wonderful. You're the apple of my eye. You're the desire of my heart. You are who I die for. You are who I got the cat of my tails for. You are the one that the crown went on my head for. You are the one I paid the price for. You are the love of my life. Isn't that beautiful? To know that God thinks of us in that way, that he positions us and brings us to a place of liberty so that he can design us, equip us, and create us in such a royal way that he calls us precious and anoints us for service. Why? Because he loves us. <coughs> Man, if we can just get a small portion of understanding, how would change our world? How would change us? How we would think different and live different. How we would treat each other different. But he equips us for service. But then there's this word crown. And I did some study on this and did a little more study on this because it was interesting. But the word crown actually means to empower. And so when you look at that word crown in the Hebrew, it, it, it gives the idea of like a royal chaplet. And I don't know if y'all have ever seen a chaplet or know a chaplet um, or know of a chaplet. Uh, what a chaplet is, is, is Catholics actually practice it, and then there's Jew, the Jews that practice it. But the, the Catholics uh, practice a chaplet in, in the idea of a rosary. Okay? Jewish chaplets, though, is a wreath around your head. And under Jewish uh, practice, when, of course, you have to go back to Jewish culture to understand what a chaplet really is, under Jewish chaplets, what a Jewish chaplet was is these the priests would wear like a wreath around their head. And what it signified was the prayers or devotion to intimacy with God. And so what they would do is they would wear this around their head. And what it also denoted was divine purpose. It gave you um, this sense of royalty or authority. Um, and the, the sense of anointing or empowerment. And so when you think of the word crown, it's not like a king's crown. You know, we, we, like, the, we like the idea, because we are fleshly, right? We like the idea of a king's crown. Why? Because it normally represents money and fame and all this wonderful worldly stuff. But in the Bible, the word, the word crown actually signifies this divine purpose or devotion of intimacy with God. And as a result, you end up with this divine purpose and authority. You begin to walk in. 
So what is verse 16 telling us? It's telling us that God positions us into a place of liberation so that he can design us in a way that he wants us to be designed because he loves us so much so that he can give us a divine purpose that is royal in the kingdom. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. That's why when you go to Peter, or go to the book of Peter, Peter says that God calls you a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. Not just any priesthood, a royal priesthood. So if you think you're nothing this morning, oh, you better think again, child of God. You are royalty. Uh -huh. You are royalty. And yes, Skip, they need to bring out the red carpet for that. They need to. Your royalty. So let's look at the last word, sparkling. Sparkling. Well, obviously, the word sparkling means to illuminate. So what does the word sparkling mean? It means to rally around as in a celebration or honor or identity or to bring significance. So what is the Lord doing? Well, if you look at Colossians 1.27, it says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Song of Solomon 2.4 says, He has brought me to his banquet hall. And his banner over me is love. Do you hear that? His banner over you is love. Exodus 17, 15. Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. Or in Hebrew, it means Jehovah Nisi. When you think of the when you think of banners, banners are used to do what? Bring honor, to celebrate. They're used to signify or identify a champion or a victory or something great that is going on. Here's the thing that I want you to understand this morning is that in all of this that he frees the captive he restores safety hope and double portions he creates us as a warrior he defends us he champions us he anoints us he positions us he equips us he empowers us but i want to give you this last thing and then john's going to come up and pray and, and, and give an altar call that, that there's this last thing that god does in our life that is so powerful is that he is your banner he is your rally cry he is the one that is champion for you in the corner when you feel like you're at the last round of a boxing match and the world has beat you to tar. And he is the one in the corner saying, you can do it, you can do it, keep on going, keep on going. You can do it, you can do it. Keep marching, keep believing, keep praying, keep giving, keep doing what you know to do because you are going to win this thing. He is your banner. My question to you this morning is, is if you had a banner in your life right now that God was waving over your head, what would that banner say? Fill in the blank. Today I need, fill in the blank, hope. Today I need encouragement. Today I need a sense of love. Today I need to know that God is on my side. He champions me. Today I need to know that there's someone out there for me. Relationship. Today I need finances. Today I need restored relationships. Today I need freedom. What is that banner? What, if you filled in that blank, what would that banner say? Because here's the thing. Whatever the need is, God is that banner over you saying, I am the answer. Because of the blood covenant that I made with you, I champion you, and my banner is you have hope, you have provision, you have relationship, you have the strength you need, you have the encouragement you need, you have all that you need, because today I am the banner that is over you. And as I am the banner that is over you, all that you need is found. John, you want to come up and pray for the prayer of the this morning. You know, this morning we've all had opportunities. And even more so this morning, maybe your position is not what it should be this morning. Maybe you're not where you ought to be. And maybe that which is raised above your head does not read what you would like it to read. You know, this morning God gives us an opportunity to be restored, to be lifted up, and to be changed. So I want to have you all bow your heads this morning, and I want to give you an opportunity this morning to change your position. Change what has been written over your head. Some of us in here this morning, you've had the enemy right over your head. Failure, disgrace, 
worthless addict broken this morning the Lord of all creation would say to you please let me change your position and if that's you this morning and you're waiting and you need God to change your position, you need God to elevate you, if that's you this morning, would you raise your hand right where you are? I see that hand. God's ready to change your position. Anyone else this morning? Maybe this morning you've been practicing church, you've been practicing religion, you've been practicing a faith. But you don't have the equipment. You don't have the true stamina. You don't have the true confidence. You don't have the true ability to reach the loss. I see that hand. I see that hand. Maybe this morning you're saying, God, I just don't know how to be the Christian you want me to be. If that's you this morning. You're, you believe you're saved, but you just don't know how to do what God's called you to do. You don't know how to walk this faith. Would you raise your hand this morning? Would you be bold enough to say, I'm not who I need to be? Praise God. I see those hands. Yes. Now finally, as we get ready to allow God to do the very thing that we're talking about, the third point that Pastor Roger brought out is that God wants to empower you. He wants to change the way you feel about you. He wants to change the way you see yourself. He wants to change your heart. He wants to elevate you to a place you've never been before. He sees you as the righteousness. He sees you as kings and queens and princes and, 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 and ever so precious to him. He sees you as royalty. He's got the blue bloodline. He says they're of my heritage. This morning, if you raised your hand, I'm going to ask you to do a, a very tough thing. In America today, we don't practice walking in faith. We don't practice surrender because we feel like it's humiliating. God says if we would just admit our wrongs to one another, the enemy would not be able to keep us down. He would not be able to keep us prisoners of our fear. But we could overcome him and put him under our feet. When we admit who we are and where we are, God can work with that. This morning, if you've raised your hand, would you come this morning? We would like to anoint you with oil this morning and pray over you and trust God to empower you this morning. Because he's going to change what's been written over your head. Yes. He's going to label you the conqueror. He's going to yes. label you the victor. He's yes. going to labor you the overcomer. He's going to labor you and, and, and call you out his child, his son, his daughter. The one that he's made and died for it and shed his blood for. If that's you this morning, would you come? Yes. Would you come now? If you raise your hand, be bold. Yes. Be bold. Just like these this morning, come and be bold. Our leadership team this morning, would you come? As we're going to pray over these that have stepped out this morning in faith. If there's anyone else this morning, don't hesitate. If you're struggling in your walk, if you're struggling in your convictions, you know, our brother this morning, he said, now, I don't know, I'm four years clean, but... You know, I bet I could stand here this morning and tell you he's had times where he thought picking up that ad, that addiction, whether it be the bottle or maybe it be a, a narcotic, he's had times where he thought, man, I could just turn back and have that peace or that excitement for a while. You know, sin has an enjoyment for a season. But God knows. He knows our weakness. He knows what we need this morning. Praise God. Thank you, brother, for coming. I know you have times to struggle. We're so grateful this morning for who God is and who he is in you this morning. Look at these this morning that are overcoming and changing the battle over their life. Amen. 
I'm challenging you this morning, you younger ones this morning. If you know who God is, it's a good opportunity to say, God, I just want a little more. I want to understand you. I want to, I want to know what your love is, and I want to know how I can love you more. Don't be ashamed of your youth. Timothy says, don't be ashamed of your zeal. To be excited about the Lord is a good thing. Amen? Father God, as we just pray as a body this morning, as we extend our life and our hands over these this morning, Father, we pray and we ask, Father, that you would meet the need, that you would bless and that you would overcome, Father, that you would give strength, God, to them that are suffering, Father, this morning, and that you would continue to encourage and lift up and build boldness and that you would give the ability to speak out who you made us, who you called us to be, God. This morning, Father, we believe in the strength and the encouraging words of love and ever understanding, God. Father, we stand in the gap with these. We stand in the gap with our brothers and sisters that have come this morning. And we say, Father, we will not let them falter. We will not let them feel weak. We will not let them feel as they've been declared by the enemy worthless and weary and bent and broken and fallen down, God. But we'll lift them up this morning and say, overcomer, victor, and ever strong in the Lord this morning. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we declare victory, we declare triumph, we declare your love and your mercy and your grace. Father God, we just say, declare, Father, who you are in us, through us, and for us, God, this morning. We ask you, Father, to continue to build this church, build this body of believers, build this family this morning, build this location, Father. We open the pen, we open the gate. We open the gate to the world around us and we say, Come you who are weak and weary, lost and undone. For we will be a place that you can be fed, you can be strengthened, you can be watched over, and you can ever be lifted up to the Lord. Amen. Amen. God is so faithful this morning. I'm so excited for these that have come. Give God a hand this morning. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough thing sometimes to step out and say, I'm in need of prayer. You know, I'm going to tell you this morning that uh, Pastor Roger might not admit it, but it's not easy dreaming big. It's not easy dreaming big and saying, God, you're calling me to do a new thing in, in St. Joe. How many knows there's a lot of churches in St. Joe? But there's over 70,000 people here. Over 70,000 people. And they say 10%, but I really think it's like 3 or 4% that probably really attend church. But you know in St. Joe, out of the 70,000, out of the 3 or 4% that are in church, you look around the communities, you look at the churches, and Pastor Roger mentioned it early on. He says, what are we, the church, doing? Jesus told his disciples and he told the Pharisees and Sadducees, he said, I've not come for the house, I've not come for the well, but I've come for the sick, the lame, the blind, the deaf, the dumb, the weak, the weary, the lost, those that are outside the church, I've come for them that need me. And I would challenge each of you to become a part of the gate, become a member, become a, a part of this movement that God's getting ready to unleash on St. Joe. Yeah. It's going to be greater than anything that anyone has ever seen. Am I saying we're better than the church down the street? No, I'm not. I'm saying we're one body, yeah. one mind, one accord unto the Lord. Amen? We're one part of the body, but we're going to be different. We're going to be different. Just as much as we are individually different, we are going to be different, and we're going to reach this community for Christ. So I'm going to challenge you this morning to next week, bring a friend, bring somebody with you that you know needs the Lord, and somebody that already has the Lord, amen? And to be inviting and to welcome people into this house. We open the shepherd's gate. We open the gate unto this community, and we say, come where you can be a part of our family and a part of our body. Amen. So glad to be a part of service with you this morning as I welcome Pastor Roger back to the pulpit. We ask you to come 
and greet us as we get ready to dismiss this morning. Bless you. Father, we thank you for this birthing this morning that you've done in the spirit and God, what you've done right here. Father, I know that there are those that may have not even come forward this morning that throughout this week, uh, you're going to be speaking to their hearts. You're going to be wooing them into your presence and into the things that you called them to. Father, I thank you this morning as well for those that answered the call and came forward this morning and got to prayer. Because, Lord, I believe that they're leaving this place new people as champions, knowing that they're being championed by the Father God in heaven. And that the banner that is flying over them right now is victory. That the banner is flying over them is you have won. That the banner is flying over them saying, I love you. You are my child. And Father, we thank you for that this morning. Father, as we leave here, we go up to the Keys and we join our sister church. God, I ask as we go into this chili cook-off and we enjoy chili and bread and fellowship and all that stuff. God, I ask that we just have a sweet time together. God, that you help us to dream to get, dream big together, Lord, as, as two separate bodies, but one, one service for one king. And Father, that as we partner together and see this world, but see most importantly, those that are around us saved for your glory. Father, we'll never fully give you praise for that. So Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.